Salute. Welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4, the legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal, Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. Take a chance and glance the membership mode. Go ahead and join today for exclusive members-only content only when you join T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On today's edition of Ralph Reads, we continue the breakneck pace of Kenyatta's escape. Written by Al C. Clark, better known as Donald Goines. A Holloway House classic, published by Kensington Publishing Corporation. Copyrighted 1974 by Al C. Clark. Copyright renewed 2002 by the children of Donald Goines. Kenyatta and his crew do what rappers write their songs to. And if you want to know what's next, let the reading commence. Chapter 3 As soon as Ali was sure Kenyatta and his small group were gone, he went into the bedroom and began searching quietly for the large stash of money that was kept there. He scratched his chin as he realized that the money was gone. The tall, brown-complexioned man sat down on the edge of the king-sized bed that took up most of the room. He thoughtfully took out his cigarettes and lit one. Even though he was now in charge, there was something wrong somewhere. He couldn't put his finger on it. But in the back of his mind, he was worried. Where could Kenyatta have hidden the money, he wondered over and over again. He didn't want to accept the fact that the money was gone. That was just too much. The money didn't belong to Kenyatta or any other single member. It was the trust fund that they were saving for hard times. So the money had to be around somewhere. His anger was slow in coming, but gradually his temper began to boil. Just the thought of Kenyatta moving the money without telling him where it was was enough to make Ali hot. Since he was the second in charge, it was something he was supposed to know about at all times. Suppose something happened to Kenyatta, then he'd be up sh**'s creek if he didn't know where the trust fund was kept. Just the idea of Kenyatta's woman knowing, while Ali didn't, made him grit his teeth in anger. The door of the bedroom opened, and Ali's woman came in. Even though she was barely over five foot tall, she was all woman. Her hips were exceptionally large, and her chest stuck out a country mile in front of her. When she smiled, a person was almost overcome by the beautiful smile she flashed, revealing teeth that movie stars would sell their souls for. God damn it, Ali cursed as she entered. How many times have I got to tell you, Vicky? To knock on the f***ing door before entering, okay? The bright smile on her face disappeared as soon as she heard his harsh words. I'm sorry, honey. She answered as her head dropped. Since I knew you were in here by yourself, I didn't think it would make any difference. That's what's wrong with the average black woman. Ali almost shouted at her as his anger increased. Now that he had someone to vent his anger on, he wasn't passing up any chances. You f***ing bitch, don't think. 
your brains are in your right between your damn legs. Vicky blinked her eyes, fighting back the tears that were already rolling down her pretty cheeks. All of her life, she had been easily hurt by what others said to her. Her feelings were more like a little girl's than a woman 22 years old. But no matter how hard she tried, she just couldn't control him. Gritting his jaws tightly, Ali stared angrily at her. Then added, And just look at you, standing there, crying like a fucking baby. What the fuck is wrong with you? Huh? What the fuck is wrong with you, Vicky? You better get hit, girl, and stop carrying your damn feelings around on your motherfucking sleeve. I, I just can't help it, Ali. I'm not used to people talking to me as if I'm a dog or something. She answered, showing more anger than she generally did. Bullsh! He snorted. If you want to get along in this fucking world, girl, you better learn something. Because soft people get stepped on every fucking day. As he stared coldly at her, his anger began to slowly disappear. It wasn't her fault, he reasoned. So why be petty and take his anger out on her? If he was honest with himself, he knew that that was just what he was doing. Since he was angry over Kenyatta rehiding the money, he was letting his anger out on his woman. Struggling with his temper, Ali opened his arms and took her into them. The short, stocky woman stepped into them like a drowning person reaching for a life belt. Ali kissed her lips slowly at first. Then as she returned his kiss with passion, he began to crush her. Because of his height, he almost had to lift her off her feet. They were still tightly embraced when the bedroom door busts open. Ali! The slim, dark-complexioned man in the doorway yelled, There's motherfucking pigs all over the place, man! What the f*** are we gonna do? Ali released his woman quickly, then rushed out of the bedroom while Jack, the man who brought the news, followed closely on his heels. Ali rushed to the front room and snatched the curtain back. The sight of all the police cars shook him to his knees. He could feel his legs trembling. His brain raced wildly. He didn't know what to do. All the other black men and women inside the house stared at him, waiting for him to give them some kind of order. Ali's brain was numb. He couldn't think. He could only stand at the window and watch the white men piling out of the cars with shotguns and rifles cradled in their arms. Detective Benson and his white partner Ryan were in the second police car that pulled up in the yard. Both men began to give orders to the uniformed policemen, trying to keep things under control. Almost imperceptibly, things began to slip out of the control of the two detectives. As one uniformed officer saw three black men run into a small white cabin, he quickly aimed the rifle he carried and took a quick shot at the fleeing men. The last man into the cabin caught the bullet in his back. He staggered inside the cabin and died on the floor. The other black men inside the cabin had been undecided at first, but at the cold-blooded killing of their friend and companion, their minds were made up for them. Before the uniformed officer who had fired a shot could reach cover, a rifle barrel came out of the already open window and the gunman took no time aiming. His first shot 
took the policeman who had started the shootout in the forehead. The man was dead before he hit the ground. His partner let out a curse, but before he could get into action, another bullet was fired, and he received a shot in his stomach. For the first few minutes of the shootout, the policemen were caught out in the open. Many of them were in front of their cars, not bothering to take cover, because they had confidence in their numbers. Most of the black men and women on the farm had pulled their weapons out as soon as the first police car had pulled into the yard, so they were ready. From the various cabins, gunfire erupted, taking a heavy toll on the police. The only place gunfire wasn't coming from was from the house, where Ali had control. He was too dumbfounded at first to take any kind of action. It wasn't until some shots took the glass out of the front window pane, barely missing him, that he pulled himself together. All at once, developing rage overcame him. He came out of his lethargy with a blinding hatred for the white pigs in uniform. Break out of this, he ordered, but it was a useless order. Already, most of the blacks in the house were armed. Only Ali and his woman hadn't picked up weapons. The sudden burst of gunfire from the house almost overcame the policemen. Call for help, Ryan yelled over at a young officer in uniform. Tell them to send reinforcements at once. Detective Benson worked his way around to the rear of the car they had come in. He opened the trunk and removed the riot gun. Taking dead aim, he began to fire slowly at the windows of the heavily occupied house. A short black man named Pete fell back from the wide window he had been firing out of. His face was covered with blood. As he fell to the carpet, another dedicated black man took his place. For the next hour, it was give and take. People died on both sides with more regularity than either side wanted. Finally, a small convoy of police cars arrived. Before that, they had been coming singly and in pairs. But now, there were over 30 police cars scattered all over the area. Ali took in the situation, his temper now firmly under control. He realized at once that they didn't have much of a choice. Either they continued to fight and die, or they gave up and were put in prison for the rest of their lives. He had no doubts about that matter. Too many police had died in the gun battle. Somebody would have to pay for their deaths. As he studied the scene in front of him, he began to concentrate on a way out. So far, the police hadn't managed to completely surround all of the farm because there were just too many cabins with guns shooting black men and women inside of them. Hey, Dickie! A tall, light-skinned Negro turned from a window in the dining room with all the glass blown out of it. What it is, the black man called back. It's time to make a move, Ali said as he began to crawl away from his window. He kept his head down next to the floor as he carefully crawled into the dining room area. A few of the black people at the remaining windows stopped shooting to hear what he had to say. Some of you keep tossing a few shots in the sea, oh, Ali ordered when he noticed everybody was watching him. Listen, Dickie, he continued. We're going to have to make a break out of here. And it's going to have to be soon. Them two are going to bring up flamethrowers and whatever the f*** else they need if this hit keeps up. I'm hip, Dickie replied. I'm surprised they haven't brought that sh up already. 
he stuck his rifle barrel out the window and took a shot at an officer, revealing too much of his body. He cursed when he saw the policeman jump back behind his automobile. I should have took my time. I could have knocked that he hawked off. Ignoring the man's words, Ali continued to crawl to the kitchen where he glanced out a window. There were too many police on that side, so he came back into the living room. I don't know which way we're going to make our break, but we had better come up with something damn quick, Ali stated. Hey, Ali. A tall, dark woman called from a side bedroom. I believe we can make it through this bedroom window. There ain't nobody really covering this side. Everybody seems to be in the front. I'll check it out, Ali, Jackie yelled out, then scrambled quickly into the bedroom. He was back in a minute. She's right, Ali. The window looks out over the horse's barn. Once we make it to the barn, the damn woods ain't too far away. Yeah, Dickie began, then said harshly, But what are we gonna do with all our wounded? We sure in the hell can't lug them all the way to the woods. Ain't nobody gonna make it if we try and carry them along. For the first time, Ali really took a close look at the people on the floor. There were three dead bodies and that many wounded. Two of the wounded ones were women and suddenly a dark flush stained Ali's cheeks as he noticed for the first time his woman, Vicky, stretched out on the floor. Blood was bubbling from a gunshot wound in her large chest, and as he crawled over to her, he could see blood on her lips. Oh, my love, he moaned as he cradled her in his arms. Damn! Damn! He cried over and over again. Didn't I tell you, dumb woman, to stay down? Didn't I, honey? There was no anger in his words, just the sound of a deep hurt. He held her tightly, crying openly now. Oh, the mother he cursed. Damn it! My God! Damn it! After checking out the bedroom himself, Dickie crawled over to where Ali held his woman. We got to make a move, man, Dickie stated quietly. If we stay here much longer, there won't be no chance of nobody getting out. Ali gestured with impatience. Them Zikaskach done hit my woman and killed her, he stated emotionally. I know, man, Dickie replied quietly. But it ain't nothing we can do about it now. It's done. And we can't help her now. That's bullshit. Ali exploded and ran to a window, exposing himself. He snatched up a rifle and took dead aim at an officer who broke from his cover at that moment and was running for a closer car. The bullet did not kill the policeman at once. It only severed his spinal cord, paralyzing the man instantly. As he lay on the open ground, screaming with pain, another policeman broke from his cover in an attempt to reach his friend and pull him to cover. Ali's first shot took the second policeman in his head, killing him instantly. A full range of bullets began to pour through the window as the angry policeman returned his deadly fire. But it was too late. Ali had dropped back to the floor and begun to crawl back toward Vicky. When he reached her, he pulled her limp head into his lap. No one had to tell him that she was gone. No one could help her now. 
As he sat there holding her, Dickie went past, followed by four other people. It's up to you, Ali, Dickie called out. We're on our way. If you want to stay and hold the fort down, that's cool with us. Ali didn't even bother to glance up. It was as if he hadn't heard the words. He sat on the floor, holding his dead woman in his lap. Tears of pain rained down his cheeks. He wished now that he had taken the time and told her how much he loved her. But now that he thought about it, he couldn't remember once having done it. Suddenly, his moment of sanity departed. A blind rage to kill overcame him again. All thoughts of fleeing were gone. Now, only revenge remained. There was nothing else on his mind. He glanced around wildly. Dickie stood in the door and watched him as he waited for the slower women in his small party to finish climbing out the window. At last, his young lady, Peggy, back and left. From the expression on Lolly's face, Dickie knew the man was gone. He rushed to the bedroom window and stuck one leg out, then quickly climbed down. Here was a short drop, only four feet from the ground. As he landed, he could see some of the other brothers and sisters halfway to the barn, and no alarm had sounded. Dickie grabbed Peggy's arm and started running for the horse stable. Three police officers on the far side of the large farmhouse saw the fleeing people. From behind their parked cars, they began to take aim. A young brother that everybody called Duke fell to the grass as a rifle shot took him high in the back. He let out a high-pitched yell as he rolled over. Dickie, bringing up the rear, didn't bother to look down as he roughly pulled his thin, tiny woman along. Peggy turned her head away on purpose. She had seen too many deaths that day to want to see another. The first black men to reach the barn, Shortman and Victor, lay down by the doorway and began to return the policemen's fire. Each man was armed with a rifle that they had brought from the farmhouse. One of the policemen pitched over, and when the other two officers glanced at their partner, they saw a gaping hole in the man's temple. The sight of their dead companion made them seek more cover. In the short breathing spell, Dickie managed to reach the horse barn. As he ran inside, he leaned back against the doorway to catch his breath. Suddenly, the sound of rapid machine gun fire came to the fleeing men and women. After Dickie left, Ali looked around the front room seeking a weapon. He spotted a submachine gun in the hands of a dead man. Keeping his head down, Ali made his way over to the corpse and removed the gun. As he quickly examined the bullet clip, he noticed that the man had never gotten a chance to fire the weapon. The gun was fully loaded. Using caution, Ali made his way to the nearest window. As he rose up, the first thing to come into sight were four plainclothes men trying to Indian up on the side of the house. Because of the long absence of gunfire, the police believed everybody inside the house was dead. Ali caught them out in the open. Two cops would run a few feet, then hit the ground, waiting until another couple repeated the same maneuver. In this way, they were worming their way up to the house. At the sudden appearance of the black man at the window, two of the plainclothes men opened fire. Ignoring the gunfire from the small pistols, Ali stood in full view 
and began to fire the automatic machine gun. In his haste, he began to spree his shots, causing him to miss all but one of the policemen. The officer that he hit was cut in half by the heavy fire from the submachine gun. The first bullet struck him in the head. Then, because of the rapid fire of the gun, there came a long line of bullet holes down from the back of the policeman's head to his spine. Ryan glanced out of the corner of his eyes at his black partner, Benson. He sighed a sigh of relief to see that his friend was still okay. Benson was lying in the grass eight feet away, holding his pistol with both hands. The black police officer was taking dead aim. When he squeezed off his shot, the black man standing in the window of the house, firing the submachine gun, jerked back as if he was a puppet on a string. Ryan pulled his finger away from the trigger of his gun. As he started to stand up, the black man in the window reappeared. With his gun pointed downward, Ryan watched the wounded man in the window raise the short-barreled sub and point it in his direction. For the first time in his life, Ryan froze. He knew that it was the end. There was no way he could raise his gun in time. The range was too short as he could see the wild-eyed gunmen plainly. The sound of an automatic went off near him, and again, the figure in the window was knocked backwards. Ryan glanced over and saw his partner, Benson, blowing the smoke off the barrel of his weapon, as though nothing had happened. Both men were well aware of the danger to Ryan but neither would mention it until a much later time when they would joke about the matter. The first bullet Ali took high in the left shoulder, and it staggered him. In seconds, he had regained control of himself and had stepped back to the window. He had spotted a white man standing up, a sitting duck. He had smiled to himself as he had taken his time and aimed at the policeman. The second shot that struck Ali had taken him right in the middle of his chest. He had let out a grunt as the force of the gunshot knocked him backwards and off his feet. He hadn't realized it when the weapon he held flew from his hands. The floor striking him in the back was the final blow and the last breath and his body departed. Had he lived he would have seen the tractor and trailer that pulled up at about the same instant he was shot. On the back of the low boy trailer were two army tanks. As Benson and Ryan watched, the soldier that had driven the truck up dropped the trailer and the tanks began to move off. Turning back to the business at hand, the two policemen finished approaching the house as the other plainclothes man came running up. The three officers tried to determine the best way to enter the house. They weren't sure that the house was empty of fighting men. As they stood debating, four more policemen came roaring up in a squad car. The uniformed policemen jumped out before the driver had even stopped. Now there were seven officers of the law on the side of the farmhouse. The uniformed officers approached the plainclothes officers and Ryan took charge at once. You guys give us some backup cover. We're going right through that motherfucking door and get the shit over with. Ryan stated loudly, even though he felt soft-spoken inside. His heart was beating like a huge water pump that worked 24 hours. The seven policemen moved to the front of the building. One of the uniformed officers rushed up and kicked the door in. Before he could regain his balance, three detectives ran past him through the front door. Their weapons were in their hands and ready for action. The first thing that Benson saw when he entered the front room of the farmhouse was the dead bodies lying about. 
A lump came up and hung in his throat as he realized that every dead person was black. In less than a minute, they had searched the farmhouse and had found it empty. The sounds of gunfire outside brought the men back outside. The late evening sunlight struck Benson in his eyes as he stepped outside. He watched the army tanks as they moved toward the small white cabins. Under his breath, he prayed for the black men and women to give themselves up. But even as he prayed, he knew it was useless. The policemen were now out for blood. Even if the blacks were to surrender, their chances of living would be slim. Besides Benson, there were only three other black policemen around the farmyard. They would have their work cut out for them if they tried to stop the white officers from taking out their revenge on the few living blacks. As Benson watched, the tank opened fire. Where a neat white cabin had been, there was now only ruins. The people inside did not stand a chance. Before the other black people in the other cabins could realize what was happening, the other tank opened fire. It was now a complete massacre. To the white army men inside the tanks, it was a game. Something like maneuvers. They had no thought about the black men and women they were killing. Suddenly, from one of the few remaining cabins, two black women and one man came out the front door with their hands over their heads. Before they had taken four steps, they were cut down by a hail of bullets from policemen stationed safely behind their police cars. The people who tried to give themselves up were shot down like mad dogs. From the barn, Dickie and Shortman and Victor had witnessed everything. I guess you guys got the message now, Dickie said loudly as his voice shook. These seas all are playing for keeps. Ain't no surrender. No kind of f***ing way. If we don't fight our way out, we ain't gonna get out. He twisted his neck around and yelled into the barn. Ain't you b****s got them horses saddled yet? Just give us a few more seconds, Peggy answered. Dickie turned back toward the scene in the farmyard. We ain't gonna have no more seconds, he screamed. This time, panic was in his voice. Them f***ing tanks are beginning to come this way! Short man jumped up from the ground as Victor laid down some covering fire. As soon as Short man reached the barn entrance, Victor followed. Out of here now, Vic stated as he ran inside the barn. As soon as the two women brought horses out, someone would take one. Peggy pulled the horses over to Dickie. These are the ones I saddled for us, she said as she noticed the fright in her man's face. Quick, Dickie yelled. Somebody get that back door open. We're gonna make a break that way. Vic and Short Man wasted no time. The other woman, Irene, leapt up on the horse she was saddling. Another girl, Donna, pushed the heavy rear barn door open, then ran to the horse she had tied near the door. All six of the black men and women made their way out the rear door, each riding a good horse. Before they had cleared the back corral, a shell from one of the tanks burst the barn wide open. The place went up in smoke and fire. The sound of the heavy explosion caused the horses to spook. The one Irene was riding began to buck, but her feet were so great that she stuck to the horse like a burr. Dickie led the way to the rear of the corral and opened the gate that led away from the farmyard. 
their luck was holding because no policeman had spotted them yet. Before all of them had cleared the gate, five policemen came running around the building and saw them trying to make their escape. A yell of alarm went up, and soon, other policemen came rushing to the rear. Two police cars roared around the building, but the ground was too chopped up for the cars to follow the horses. Before they could clear the range of the tanks, one of the tanks came around the building and took aim. The shell exploded about 20 feet away from the fleeing horsemen. The shock of the shell bursting knocked Short Man right out of the saddle. The other five horsemen kept on riding. Dicky rode the horse he was on like he had never ridden before. His heart was beating so fast he thought it would burst. In his mind, he knew this was the most frightened he had ever been in his life. In front of them were a line of trees. If he could only reach them, they would have a good chance of getting away. Kenyatta had laid out an escape route for them long ago, and Dicky was thankful now that he paid attention to it. He glanced back once at his woman, who was riding just as hard as he was. She yelled something to him, but because of the pace of the horses, he couldn't understand what she was trying to say. He turned around in the saddle and concentrated on some hard riding. Just a few more feet, Lord, he prayed, not aware that he was really talking out loud. At the sight of Short Man getting knocked clean off his saddle, Victor bent down lower and rode harder. No matter how hard he rode, he couldn't seem to gain on Dicky and Peggy. One of the police cars with five policemen in it came crashing through the cornfields, trying to cut the horsemen off. When the officers saw that they wouldn't be able to reach the riders, the driver pulled up quickly. One of the officers yelled, We got them in rifle range! Let's try picking them off! As soon as the car came to a bumping stop, two of the policemen with rifles jumped out and ran around to the hood of the car. They rested their rifles on the hot steel and took dead aim. The first shot they fired was a miss. But the second officer was a sharpshooter. He never let his aim leave the rider he had picked out. As Donna bent over and struck her horse on the side, trying to get more speed out of it, she felt something go past her face. She started to glance back, but suddenly something struck her in the middle of her back and lifted her from the saddle. Before she struck the ground, she was dead. When the police saw the rider fall, they let out a yell and began to dance around the car as if they were at a party. Victor rode past her, knowing as he passed that there was nothing he could do for the woman. A ball of hatred rose up in his throat as he saw the woman he loved lying on the ground. Even as he rode, he prayed for the strength to one day be able to make the pigs pay for what they had done this day. When they reached the woods, Dickie led the way through them. They had to slow the horses down to walk, but it was okay. For now, the cops weren't on their trail. They had a few minutes, and Dickie believed that was all that they needed. If everything was like Kenyatta had left it, they had a good chance of getting away. The four people rode in silence. Nobody bothered to ask Dickie where he was going. They just followed. After about ten minutes, Dickie came out at a run-down cabin with a dilapidated barn behind it. He dismounted from his horse and directed the rest of the group to do the same thing. He led the way to the barn and opened the sagging doors. Inside was an old station wagon. Dickie got in and opened the ashtray. Sure enough, inside the ashtray were the keys to the car. He let out a sigh of relief as the rest of his small group climbed in. For a second, the station wagon didn't want to start. But finally, the motor caught 
and everybody began to breathe easier. Dickie lit a cigarette before putting the car in gear. I say it's too hot for us back in Detroit. So from here, we're going on to Chicago, and from there, we'll wait at the hideout until Kenyatta reaches us. Nobody bothered to answer. Each person in the car was too thankful to be alive, let alone have something to complain about. It didn't matter where they went, just as long as they got the hell away from there. Back at the farmyard, Detective Benson glanced around at the slaughter. The superintendent was now taking charge since all the fireworks were over. As he watched, Benson wondered about the sharp feeling of pride that went through him as he saw all of the dead bodies of his comrades. As he watched the survivors line the eight slain officers up side by side, ambulances rolled in and out of the yard, carrying away the wounded to the nearby hospitals. At least, those brothers made them pay a dear price for their victory. With eight policemen killed, the newspapers would play it up big. This was the first time to his memory that any black or white crooks had ever made such a dent in the police forces at a single shootout. Instantly, he felt ashamed of the feeling of pride in what the black men and women had done. After all, he was an officer also, and these were his comrades, so there was nothing to be proud about. Eight of his fellow officers lay dead, and there had been a good chance of him being one of those with a sheet over his head. If he needed anything to justify his feelings, the sight of the tanks being reloaded on the trucks gave it to him. The use of the tanks had left a very bitter taste in his mouth, but had been the right thing to do. Why waste lives when you could call up such help? If the tanks had been there at first, none of the men lying under those blankets would be dead now. Those f***ing tanks were lifesavers, weren't they? Ryan said as he came up beside his partner. Benson, taken by surprise, glanced around at his partner quickly, hoping Ryan couldn't read what he was sure was showing in his face. Yeah, Benson answered. If it hadn't been for those tanks, it might have cost us more men than it did. You can say that again, Ryan replied. Those bastards didn't know the meaning of quit. His words brought a sharp fleeting pain to Benson, because he remembered all too well what happened to the ones who tried to quit. They had been shot down like mad dogs. He wondered what the outcome would have been had the people in the cabins have been all white. Would they have used tanks and flamethrowers on them then? Benson shook his head, trying to shake off the useless thoughts. Ryan stared at his partner in surprise, wondering what was disturbing him. I know this was a messy thing out here, Ben, but if you want, we could get the hell away. A few of those people made it to the woods, but we don't have to worry about it. The sheriff and his men are throwing up roadblocks all over the woods, so once they leave them damn horses, they'll be caught like fish in a motherfucking barrel. Yeah, I know, Benson answered more sharply than he intended. Since they'll be the only black things out there on foot, it shouldn't be too hard to spot them out on the highway trying to get a fucking lift. Hey, man, Ryan said quietly, take it easy. I know this wasn't easy for you. But these f***ing guys got what they deserved. They're responsible for I don't know how many policemen's lives. So if you feel sorry for somebody, how about feeling sorry for some of the police widows these bastards created? Benson forced himself to grin. I got you, man. Just overlook me for a few minutes, okay? Those tanks were kind of hard to take. I saw what kind of damage they did. And it's just hard to accept, that's all. For a minute, both officers were silent. The sun was just beginning to go down 
and the activity in the farmyard was an eyeful by itself. Television men now ran back and forth while their camera crews followed lugging their heavy equipment. Before any of the television newsmen could reach them, Ryan pulled his partners on. Let's get our car and head downtown. The captain says he wants to see us right away. I think they have a very special mission for us coming up. Special, huh? Benson replied and snorted. I'll just bet it's special. What the f*** do they want us to do? Go down to the morgue and identify the remains of half of these bodies that's been burned damn near to a f***ing crisp? Again, Detective Ryan gave his partner that funny look out of the corner of his eye. Something was disturbing the hell out of Benson that he was sure of, but he just couldn't put his finger on what it was. Chapter 4 Kenyatta stepped out of the cockpit. The first thing he saw was an abundance of dead bodies. He stared at one corpse especially. It was his friend Zeke. He and Zeke had done a lot of things together. And it hurt deeply to see his lifelong friend stretched out cold on the floor of the airplane. As people came running up to him with silly questions, he continued on through the plane stopping to examine the wound that Red had in his shoulder. He leaned over and tore Red's shirt so that he could get a better look at the ugly wound. Is there a doctor anywhere in the plane? He asked sharply, his eyes searching the passengers' faces. A short, red-faced white man got up from his seat and came forward. Yes, I'm a doctor, the man stated. Good. Then do what you can for my friend here, Kenyatta ordered then continued on his way through the airplane. When he reached the rear of the plane, Betty stared into the eyes of her man. They looked at each other closely. Then Kenyatta spoke. Sugar, find out if any of these f***ing stewardesses know how to let down the emergency ladder from this f***ing plane. We're gonna have to start walking. Then, after that, find out how much water is on this motherfucking plane and see to it that some of our people take control of it. We're gonna need every motherfucking drop of it more than likely, cause we're on the motherfucking fucking desert. Damn. Betty cursed, then quickly walked toward the nearest stewardess to follow out her man's order. Kenyatta made his way back up the aisle. He stopped and glanced down at Anne. He knew at once she was dead. He cursed under his breath as he wondered how the hell things got so far out of control while he was in the cockpit. There was no sense in him trying to force someone. It was over and done. Nothing he could say or do would bring the dead back to life. Whoever was responsible would carry the blame on his mind from now on. Somebody had been careless. It was the only explanation for things getting out of control the way they did. When he had gone into the cockpit, everything had been in order. Kenyatta then noticed the two dead white men and the guns they held. Suddenly, he knew what had happened. The whiteies had taken his group by surprise. The way he saw it, it couldn't have happened any other way. Eddie B. came up running to Kenyatta. Man, we are in one hell of a fix, Kenyatta. What the f*** are we gonna do about it? Kenyatta glanced at the smaller man, wishing that he had been killed instead of his reliable friend Zeke. Don't get upset, Kenyatta said, not letting his thoughts show. If you want something to do, go to the rear of the plane and give Betty a hand. Before Eddie B. could ask any more questions, Kenyatta quickly walked past the man. He noticed the dead black woman and again wondered just how the f*** she died. It must have been a stray bullet, he reasoned, and went on past a grieving threesome. Chuck stood near the cockpit, waiting on Kenyatta. He didn't bother to ask any foolish questions. He just waited silently 
for his leader to tell him what to do next. Kenyatta put his arm around Jug's shoulder. Boy, he began, we got big problems on our hands, Jug. Again, Jug remained silent, waiting for Kenyatta to continue. We're going to have to leave this fucking plane out here in the middle of nowhere, man. I'm having the women collect all the water we can carry, so maybe we won't have any water problem. But the damn problem is, I don't know where the fuck we are. Except for being on some damn desert, I don't have the damnest idea of where we are at this moment. Jug smiled slightly. If anybody can pull us out of this shit, Ken, he stated, you can. So just keep the faith, boy. Just keep the motherfucking faith. Kenyatta smiled at Jug, then spoke up loudly for the rest of the men and women in his group could hear. We're getting ready to leave this airplane, so take whatever you think you might need. Any of you girls that were wearing high heel shoes that are hard to walk in, exchange them with some of the passengers. Now, no telling how damn far we may have to walk. Flat bottom shoes will be ideal for what's in front of us. Ken, honey? Betty called to him from the rear of the airplane. We have the ladder down now. It's not as easy as the ramp was to come up, but all of us should be able to go down it without too much damn trouble. She spoke in a matter-of-fact voice. Okay, then. I guess we had better start making some kind of preparations to get red down the ladder, Kenyatta said as he walked over to where the doctor was, still working on Red's shoulder. Hey, man, he said as he bent over to Red. How the f*** are you feeling? Red glanced up at him and tried to smile. Ish, Kenyatta. I've been hurt worse than this by a bite my woman put on me. The doctor shook his head. This man is in no shape to be trying to make a trip across any desert, he stated with authority. Well, Doc, Kenyatta replied, he might not be in any shape. But I'll bet he'll be better off with us than waiting for the law to come and pick him up and take him to the nearest f***ing prison hospital. No, we ain't about to leave him here for some bullshit like that. You people will be rescued more than likely before dusk tomorrow. But the only thing Red will have waiting for him will be a prison cell. Doc, if you've got any heavy drugs in that bag of yours, please leave them with us. Maybe, if we can keep him drugged enough, he won't feel the pain so bad. It's going to be hell out there for all of us, but it's our only chance, and we ain't about to pass it up. Kenyatta glanced up and down the plane. Betty, see if you can find some kind of stretcher or something that we can carry rent. Will do. She called back. Her voice sounded cheerful under the circumstances. Chug walked over to the automatic ladder that had been let down. You want I should go down and take a quick look around, Ken? He inquired. Good idea, baby boy. Damn good idea. Kenyatta yelled back. Check out everything you can see. Then come on back up and give me a motherfucking lowdown on it. Kenyatta watched a tall, dark-complexioned man disappear out the open side door. It seemed like little more than seconds had passed before Jug was jumping back through the door. His face lit up with excitement. Hey, Kenyatta, he yelled out. We're going to have company in a minute. I seen and heard some goddamn motorcycles coming this way. It looked to be at least five of them. Hmm, <laughs> Kenyatta snorted, then added. Cool on that. Yes, sirree. Cool on that. Looks like we might not have to walk off this motherfucking desert after all. He glanced at his followers, and all of their faces were turned toward him expectantly. What we'll do is wait until they get here. Then we'll fake like we're passengers until we can get the drop on them. After that, we'll just let them join the passengers up here while we use their bikes to get the fuck out of here. I hope enough of you know how to ride a motherfucking bike. Because if you don't, you're gonna get some damn quick lessons on it today! He smiled, taking the sting out of his words. I still say, the doctor said as he came up to Kenyatta, that this boy on the floor is hurt too bad to attempt to try and take him out of here. If you do, his death will be on your conscience. 
Kenyatta grin at the man. If I don't, his confinement will be on my god mind from now on, Doc. So I ain't got much of a choice. In fact, I'll leave the choice up to Red. He's awake. Ask him what the hell he wants to do. Stay here and await medical attention? Or take his chances with us? The doctor glanced down at the stricken man. Red grinned up at him. He's running it to you right, Doc. I thank you for what you've done, man. But ain't no way, no sore shoulder is gonna keep me here until Johnny Law arrives. No, sir. I'll take my chances out there on the desert with the rest of my people. Sh Once my people leave, what the hell do I know what will happen? These mad-ass passages just might try to take their anger out on me, and then I'd be in one hell of a fix, wouldn't I? For an answer, the doctor shrugged his shoulders and returned to his seat. He didn't bother to leave any drugs. Hey, Doc, Kenyatta yelled. Didn't you forget something? Before the doctor could answer, Kenyatta continued. I asked you to leave us some drugs. Something that will kill the pay from a man over here. Now, if you want to act ish, we can take you along with us to take care of him. The threat was enough. The doctor opened his bag quickly and removed some pink and white pills. These are very strong pain pills. In fact, the doctor continued, they are habit forming if a person takes them too often. Let us do the worrying about the habit forming bit, Doc. You just set that sh out, Kenyatta ordered. Betty called from her spot near the ladder. Honey, the bikes are damn near here. It was unnecessary for her to say anything because everybody on the plane could hear the motorcycles as they came roaring up. Kenyatta rushed to the ladder and began to climb down. As he climbed, he could see six bikes swinging around near the side of the huge 707 airplane. Hey, what it is? Kenyatta called out in his most cheerful voice as he came down the ladder. Are we glad to see you people? We thought we were down over no man's land. A tall, blonde-headed man with hair down to his shoulders spoke up. You damn near are. What happened? Did the plane crash? Nah, man, Kenyatta stated as he dropped smoothly to the ground. The pilot had engine trouble, so he had to set her down the best place he could. By the way, Kenyatta continued, where the hell are we? One of the other bikers spoke up. You're about 100 miles from Las Vegas and 300 from Los Angeles, buddy. It's that bad, huh? Kenyatta asked, studying the group of people in front of him. He noticed at once that two of the bike riders were women. Well, what the hell are you people doing so far away from everything? Kenyatta asked, wondering where their camp could be. Oh, it's not as bad as it seems, one of the women said as she tossed her long red hair back out of her face. There's a ranch just over those sand hills. We saw your plane coming in, so we started riding out this way. The blonde-headed man cut his eyes at her sharply before he spoke up. What's wrong with the rest of the passengers? Can any of them climb down the ladder? Oh, <laughs> yeah, man, it's a few men up there who could climb down, but the women don't want to come down until I found out what's going on. Just who the hell are you? The blonde man asked sharply. From the tone of his voice, Kenyatta could tell that he was one of those that couldn't stand the black man. I happen to be the guard on this plane, Kenyatta answered sharply. The pilot was hurt during the landing, so it's my job to find out just what the hell is going on before I can allow the passengers to come down. We are paid to protect the passengers at all costs. I guess you understand where I'm coming from. A few of the people on their bikes nodded their heads. Then Kenyatta added the clincher. If any of you want to go up now, it's okay with me. I just don't feel up to the climb right this minute, you dig? Before anyone could take him up on his offer, Jug came climbing down the ladder. The white people on the motorcycles stared coldly at the second black man. Kenyatta bowed and held out his hand. Be my guest. 
and go on up and look for yourselves. The lady stewardess will fill you in on anything I've left out. Now, he said, turning directly toward the red-headed woman, I'd like to know a little more about this ranch you spoke of. Do you think it could handle as many people as we have aboard this plane? Would it be a very difficult walk for some of them? You know, all of the passengers aren't as young as we are, he stated, and then winked at her. Her sharp laugh rang out and seemed to irritate the tall blonde man. He cursed, then climbed off his bike. I'll think I'll just climb up the ladder and see what the hell's going on, he stated and stared coldly at Kenyatta as if he wanted him to try and prevent him from going up the ladder. Help yourself, Kenyatta said. Maybe you can even help some of the older people down while you're up there. The blind man didn't bother to answer. He just began to climb the ladder swiftly. In seconds, he was making his way through the open hatchway. Before any of the other bike riders could get set, Kenyatta and Jug set themselves so that they surrounded the bikes. As soon as the tall white man entered the airplane, he knew something was wrong. The first sight that greeted him was that of dead bodies lying around in the aisles. He cursed as he stared at the sight. What the sh- Just take it easy, Daddy, Betty said as she slipped up beside him. Just take it easy and call one of your other friends up here. The hell you say? The man swore and then made a quick grab at the gun in her hand. Betty took one step back and pulled the trigger. The hard-hitting magnum knocked the tall blonde man off his feet. Before he hit the ground, she had pumped another round into his body. It could have went so easy if the bastard had only had some sense. The sound of the gunshot was somewhat muffled, but not enough so that the people on the ground did not hear it. They stood looking up at the plane. What the hell's going on up there? One of the male bike riders inquired. Kenyatta removed his gun and held it on the people. I'll tell you what, Kenyatta stated. You start climbing up the ladder. Then you can call back down and let your friends know just what's happening up there. The man Kenyatta had spoken to stared at the gun in the black man's hand, then at the ladder. Hey, buddy, I don't give a shit what's going on up there. I'll just start my bike up and leave this party to you people. The bullet from Jug's gun took the man in the side of the head. He never knew what hit him. Jug stared around at the rest of the bike riders. His eyes were cold. Well now, Kenyatta said, looks like he won't do any more bike riding for a hell of a long time. You, Kenyatta ordered, pointing his gun at one of the other men. Get to climbing. The man didn't waste any time. He jumped off his bike and raced for the ladder. He went up like a monkey, never bothering to look back as fear added speed to his arms and legs. When he entered the airplane, Betty was waiting for him. He took one glance at his friend stretched out on the floor of the airplane and stuck his hands in the air. Please don't shoot, he begged. Your friend down on the ground told me to come up. Other than that, I don't want to know nothing about what's going on up here. Well now, you seem to have the right idea on how to survive. You just keep thinking that way. Now you find you a seat somewhere, and I'm sure won't nothing happen to you. Before the words were out of her mouth, the man hurried over to an empty seat and balled up in it. He dropped his head down on his chest as though he were asleep, but everybody could see his shoulders shaking from fear. Back on the ground, Kenyatta turned to the only remaining man. Now then, friend. I'd like to have a little more information on this ranch you say that's just over the hill. How many people are still there? As soon as the man hesitated, Kenyatta raised his pistol and shot him out of the seat of the bike. I guess we can do without a slow thinker. Anybody who has to take that long to think shouldn't be living. 
The two women shivered as they watched the cold-blooded killing. Now then, Kenyatta said, turning to the red-headed woman, I'm going to ask you some easy questions, and it's up to you whether or not you live. If I think you're lying, I'm going to blow your shit out. Is that clear? The red-headed woman could only shake her head in agreement. I I'll do my best, she replied, her voice shaking. Now, baby, you're going to do better than your best. You're going to tell me the fucking truth or die. Is that clear? It was all too clear. She again shook her head. Yes, I understand, she mumbled. Okay, then. Now we understand each other, Kenyatta said easily, as he took out his smokes and lit one. First of all, I want to know how many people are still at the ranch. There's five people left there, she answered quickly. What are they, men or women, Kenyatta asked. There's three women and two men left at the ranch, she answered him instantly. Kenyatta smiled. Good. That's fine, honey. You don't have to worry. If you just keep on being for real, you'll come out of this shit I. In fact, I promise you, you'll come up smelling like a rose. The other woman, a slim, black-haired girl, held on to the handlebars of her bike as though her life depended on it. She glanced from one black man to the other. Jog walked over to the black-haired girl and nudged her in the ribs with his gun. Is she telling the truth? He asked sharply as he leaned over and stared in her face. The woman was so scared she could only move her head up and down. As Jug stood there, he noticed a puddle of water beginning to run off the bike and knew that the woman had actually pissed on herself in fright. I think they're telling the real Ken, Jug said as he walked back away from the woman, grinning. I think so too, Kenyatta replied. It sounds so damn good, it's hard to believe. Here we land in the middle of fucking nowhere, and now we got a goddamn dude ranch right next door to us, waiting for us to take it over. Hey, redhead, Kenyatta called out. Who's the fucking owner of this joint, huh? First, the red-headed woman pointed upward with her head, then managed to say, The blonde man who went up in an airplane first. Oh, Kenyatta drew the word out. Shit. Then we ain't got no problems, because his next of kin will have to worry about the ranch. He's past the worrying stage. Suddenly, Betty came climbing down the ladder. She moved with the sureness of a man. When she reached the bottom, she took in the two women and her eyes became slits. What's happening down here, Daddy? She inquired as she tossed a look at the redhead that promised trouble down the road. Nothing, honey. We're just getting a little information, that's all, Kenyatta responded, ignoring the obvious jealousy of his mate. Well, Betty stated coldly as she posed with her hands on her hips. If you're having trouble out of the bitches, why don't you let me handle it? I'm sure they will be glad to talk to me. Kenyatta laughed loudly. It's just the opposite, baby. We ain't having no kinds of problems whatsoever. The ladies are being very helpful. Betty glared first at one woman, then at the next one. It was written in her eyes what she wanted to do. The magnum in her hand twitched as she nervously handled it. She finally glanced back up at Kenyatta. Well, just what the hell are we supposed to do? Just sit out here forever? Kenyatta stared at her coldly. Now don't get beside yourself for nothing, baby. I'll take care of everything. When I get all the information I want, then we will make a move. Until then, just play it cool. I guess you want me to go back up on the airplane while you finish getting your information, right, Kenyatta? Betty asked sharply. Wrong, I don't give a shit if you dig a motherfucking hole in the sand and crawl in it. But whatever you do, you better get your mind right. Because this ain't no motherfucking game. Now, if you want to stay, don't act this shit because there's no reason for it. Like I said, 
These girls are being really helpful. And I don't want you f***ing them over for nothing. His words brought a small bit of relief to both of the white women. Because it was obvious that the tall black woman wouldn't like anything better than to cut them down with the pistol that she carried. Chuck, Kenyatta spoke quietly. You go back up in the plane and have our people collect every weapon up there. Then have them start coming down one at a time. We're going to have to move to the ranch. But before you do anything, be sure the fucking radio on the airplane is ripped out so that nobody can put it together again. You got that? Kenyatta inquired as the tall black man started to leave. Jug stopped and nodded his head, then continued on his way. After the departure, Jug, Betty relaxed a little. She listened quietly as Kenyatta inquired about the ranch and the nearest town. As far as they could find out, there wasn't a soul within 50 miles. It was ideal. They would have plenty of time to make their escape before anybody had the slightest idea where they were. You say there's three cars at the ranch? Kenyatta asked again. The red-headed woman nodded her head. Yes, plus four doom buggies that we use on the desert. Wonderful, Kenyatta stated as he clapped his hands in glee. Betty baby. It couldn't have been any sweeter. Girl, we got Jesus in the jug, woman, and you can't even see it. I see it, but how the f*** do we know what the truth is? This bitch could be lying, you know? Betty stated coldly. At the sound of her words, Kenyatta just shook his head. Damn it, woman. If she's lying, she knows damn well I'm going to kill her. So you can bet your she ain't hardly gonna do that. Redhead wants to live too bad, don't you, redhead? That tall, red-headed woman could only nod her head. The sight of the tall black woman gave her more fear than she had felt when both black men had been talking to her. She believed she could handle them, but the woman was another matter. For the slightest reason, the woman would kill her, and the redhead knew it. Fear gripped her entire body. She could not stop her legs from shaking. It didn't take long before the rest of the small group began to come down the ladder. Jug had carried out his orders to a T. He was the last one down the ladder, waiting patiently until the two people helping the wounded Red brought him down the ladder. The doctor had given him a shot of morphine, keeping the wounded man from feeling too much pain as he was carried down the ladder. When they reached the ground, they gathered around Kenyatta, each one with a different question. What about the passengers? One of his group asked from the background. Worry about them, Kenyatta replied. We set one man up there from the ranch so he can lead them over there sometime tomorrow. It ain't far, it's just a few hours walk. They will make it out all right. As for us, we're going to take over the ranch for a minute. Then, given the right break, we'll strike out for the promised land. Right now, I want everybody who can ride a bike to get on one. Those who can't, get on the rear. We're going to take these two white ladies along with us. So show them the proper respect, you hear? There was laughter at his warning. The small group got aboard the motorcycles and began the trip across the sand dunes. Another episode outro, so you know, I'll see ya for the next edition of Ralph Reads. I would like, or rather love, to thank you queens and kings for stopping by. If you would like to leave a small donation, Please go to www.solo.to forward slash rgmc2407. Tell a family member to tell their friend. Maybe that friend will tell a member of their family to stand with me. And T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free.
I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the next edition of this Donald Goins miniseries on Ralph Reed's. Yes, yes, y'all. You don't quit. Stay out of Kenyatta's way or you might get hit. Yes, yes, y'all. You don't stop. Ain't nowhere safe. Not even for cops.